All right. Well, welcome everyone. I see we've got people from all over joining in on the chat. Um, if you're just joining, feel free to let us know where you're calling in from in the chat function. Thank you all so much for joining today um, for what's about to be a great conversation. I'm Danielle, Wildlands Network's Communications Manager, um, and I'll be giving you a brief overview before turning it over to Juan Carlos, our Conservation Programs Director, and of course, our honored guest today, Ignacio Jimenez. Our discussion today is focused around Ignacio's book, Effective Conservation, Parks, Rewilding, and Local Development. The book is based on Ignacio's extensive experience managing conservation projects across three continents over 30 years, including coordinating the largest wildlife reintroduction program in the Americas in Argentina with Tompkins Conservation. Effective Conservation is published in English by Wildlands Network's longtime publishing partner, Island Press, who is graciously offering a 30% discount on the book for any of today's participants um, to buy the book online. So I'll put some details in the chat about that shortly. Um, as we're going, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to add those to the chat and we'll address them um, <clears throat> as we're able. And now let me turn it over to Juan Carlos and Ignacio. Thank you, Danielle, and thank you everyone for being here joining us today. Um, I will be basically um, asking a few questions of Ignacio so that he can tell us more, more about his life and his book. I, I'd like to start, Ignacio, if you're okay with it, um, by having you tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your life experience? How did you end up in conservation, etc.? Hola, Juan Carlos, uh, and good morning, everybody. So let's see my origins on, um, yeah, yeah. Where do I come from? Let me switch to my computer. Wait. Okay, so everything starts with, I mean, being a little kid. I mean, um, I, mean I grew up in a, the third city in Spain, Valencia. Uh, but I had rural roots because I would always go to my, my family's rural house and I always wanted to be a biologist. So this is kind of the beginning. And I remember, I mean, I, had a I have a brother who's 10 years older and he was already a biologist and going out to the field with him and his friend and being there in a river uh, while they were doing some sampling and just thinking that biologists sound like the most fun world, uh, work in the world. So I wanted to be a biologist. So I studied that, I did my studies in, in Valencia, in Spain, and I was lucky enough to travel to Central America in 94. I went to Costa Rica, uh, and that was a big shock for me. I mean, moving from dry Mediterranean climate to the rainforest. Uh, I started doing a master thesis there on, on manatees, on sea cows. But I think one important thing beyond starting to work in Latin America and getting to know the tropics and its huge diversity and abundance was getting in contact with the world of conservation biology. I mean, that was in the early 90s. And I really remember reading this book that is very much connected with the Wildlands Project and your own roots. Uh, and reading what I think was opening chapter by Michael Soule and him talking about a discipline with a mission. So at that time, there was a big kind of change inside me from seeing myself as a biologist and starting to see myself as a conservationist and trying to help in that mission to kind of stop or at least to diminish a little the, the sex extinction. During those years, I also was lucky to go to Madagascar. I was there in three years. Uh, I was working with this very rare Sifaka, the Golden Crown Sifaka. Uh, as you know, Madagascar is one of the biodiversity hotspots in the world. But I mean, at that time, I also started seeing the connection between uh, biodiversity hotspots and what is typically rural uh, poverty and marginalization. The, the, the same I was seeing in Nicaragua working with manatees. So 
I mean, in this kind of personal trip from a kid who grew up in a city and wanted to be a biologist and now becoming more and more involved in conservation, it was very clear that there was an overlap between uh, rural poverty and biodiversity. And I couldn't do the become a conservationist without kind of dealing with the first uh, one way or another. I, I was, I went to El Salvador, one of the most populated countries in, in America, uh, very few protected areas. Again, uh, poverty and huge social problems that became even more complicated in the later years. So in this kind of personal journey, uh, after being in, in Central America for more than 10 years, I moved to Argentina because I fell in love with an Argentinian woman. And I was traveling to Chile and I found out about these guys who were creating parks in Chile and Argentina, the Tompkins. I was lucky enough to get in contact with the team working in Argentina. And I ended up working here in Northeastern Argentina in a subtropical area, very different from Patagonia. Everybody relates the Tompkins with Patagonia, which is here in the South. Uh, and the, the idea was to create a huge national park and to reintroduce at least six species that went locally extinct. Uh, that was, I, will, I worked there for 14 years and, and that was a big change from the typical role of being a researcher or a consultant, telling other people what to do to actually having to do it, which, mean, which meant hiring people, creating a team, uh, providing vision, uh, learning, because it was the, nobody had done that before in Latin America. I mean, introducing giant anteaters or jaguars or not even in Latin America, no, no, nowhere else in the world. During those years, I was also, I got in contact with the, what the people were doing in Southern Africa, in, in countries like South Africa, Botswana, Namibia. And we learned, because we were interested in jaguar introduction, that in that continent, they were doing things that were two or three decades ahead of many other continents, especially in the way they were, they were connecting protected areas, some private, some public, with rewilding, with restoration, and also with local development. So there's a huge influence from Africa also in, in my profession right now, I mean, in the way I see myself and also in the book. And in the last four years, I returned into Spain. Uh, with kind of the idea of using approaches that work well in the in this south, in the undeveloped south or developing south in, in Western Europe. And it's been also a challenge. So what, what you see here is someone who moved, let's say, from biologist to conservationist. And now I see myself mostly as a practitioner. Uh, and very much mestizo. I mean, so I have this American influence from reading the Sule books and the conservation biology books, working with the Tonkins. I'm European myself. I'm very much Latin American because I worked there for 20 years, but there's a huge influence from Africa and what I learned from them. So that, that would be the character you are, you are listening to today. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, and Ignacio. That's that's a very interesting life story <laughs> that I'm sure several of us are envying at this point. <laughs> so, what what prompted you to to write this book? You you went through all of these different life stages, and suddenly you thought, "I need to sit down and write a book." It might as it could have been a an autobiography, and it would still be interesting. But you decided to sit down and write uh, what is, in my opinion, a much more complex book. Uh, okay, I think well, something that probably is obvious to you right now is this this kind of this feeling of passion. I mean, conservation is a passion, and I'm very passionate about it. But and the other one is curiosity. I mean, the, I, probably I've been going to so many places because I'm very curious about other cultures, other societies, other ecosystems, and also I have this I have habit of I read a lot. Uh, not, not so many people read nowadays. nowadays. So uh, through this process, I learned a lot about uh, different techniques and approaches about conservation. And I was very interested in sharing that with, with, with other conservationists. I actually wanted to write the book that I would have liked to read when I was 25 or 30 years 
all because it takes too long to get all these disciplines from other places and just put them together. So there was a moment, I mean, the idea of the book started in 98 when I get my first training course. <laughs> Uh, thank God I didn't write the book at that time because it would have been much worse, for sure, much more theoretical and with less experience. But by 2015, uh, there was this book growing in my head and I wanted to just get it out of my system and just to share it with people. And that's, that's been the, the result also of dozens of training courses that I've been doing through years. So it's books, experiences, and PowerPoint slides turn into a book and in a method. Yeah, that, that we'll explain later. So yeah, we, we might as well jump into it. What, what is this method that, that you propose in your book, the thing you call full nature or in Spanish, producción de naturaleza, uh, that, that you felt was lacking from conservation literature, and that would be your, your contribution to it? Okay, I, I think, I mean, the, the book has like, like two parts. One is, I call it ideological, which is this concept of full nature, which is kind of a difficult translation from the concept of producción de naturaleza. And this part is about how to, what I learned in those years in Iberá and how I reflected in what I had seen in Central America and, and then what I saw in Africa. And it comes from, from the challenges that, that we had to face in Ibera. I mean, uh, uh, in this area that you see here, we were working in a provincial preserve that was a typical paper park. We were buying land, uh, all these areas in, in dark green, and we wanted to donate that to the nation of Argentina to create a national park. Uh, at the same time, we were restoring the species that were locally lost. And uh, the reaction of the local people and the national uh, public is either of, I don't believe it, or I don't care, or I don't trust you. So something that was kind of thought as a gift to, to, to a nation, it was uh, received with, with hostility. So it became very clear that, let's say, the kind, kind of the American narrative that, that Douglas was, the Tonkis were bringing to, to the area, it wasn't working. I mean, the people were not interested in a national park. And the whole concept of conservation philanthropy, which, is, which has a long tradition in North America, it was totally alien to the, to, to the Argentinians. There's no philanthropy and there's even less conservation philanthropy. So uh, the people didn't believe what we were doing. Uh, they thought that we were gonna steal the water and that this was, that uh, Tonkis was kind of a CIA agent uh, working for the American government to get the big reserves of water in South America. They didn't believe that, that, that we were gonna create a park. And, and even if they believed it, they, they, were not, they were not interested. So, and during those years, it was very, I mean, often we will hear when we're talking about conservation and creating a park, uh, the, the big guys, I mean, the politicians and the landowners will say that we had to balance development and conservation. And every time you hear that you have to balance both things, I mean, through those voices, it was very clear in that balance which side was going to lose. And they were talking about this balance inside a protected area. Or outside the protected area, there was no balance at all. Everything was development. So we, we thought if, if that's going to be the choice and if that's going to be the, the, the dilemma, uh, we're, we're losing. We're, we're going to get spelled of this area. So we changed the narrative and we started saying, okay, guys, we are we're doing production. We, we produce, we are productores. Uh, we own land and this land uh, creates wild landscapes, scenery and wildlife and look at our neighboring village that this is a campground that was donated by, by Douglas to, the, to this municipality. This village, they have the best social and economic indicators in the whole region. And that's because they have this kind of clients and, and customers and they have a different economy. And these guys are coming to see our wildlife and the wildlife that is being produced and worked in, in the public lands. And because of this uh, village that was a village of children and old people, because all the youngsters were living in the 80s, 
Now, in the early 2000s, the, the young people could stay there and work there and drink their mate. And this was, this was a, an anomaly. The thing is, the moment we started talking in those terms, the society listened in a much better way. And we became, we moved from being uh, freaks or dangerous people to becoming relevant. And that, that allowed us to start talking with the government and with the, with the neighbors. Like we are yes, producers, we work, for, we work the land like anybody, but, but what we do is we produce nature. And this creates this and these social benefits and they are better than the other options. And that was a game changer. So this is the concept of full nature. And this is kind of the first chapter of the, of the book. We talk about how we, we can connect protected areas. When we talk about parks, it could, they could be public or private, depends on the country and the context. With rewilding, actually, I mean, ecosystem restoration with having complete ecosystems. Of course, if the ecosystem is complete, you don't need to be wild because they are there. With wildlife that is easy to see, that is abundant. So we can create a restorative economy based on nature, on a non-extractive use of nature that also uh, connects with traditions, with culture. And in that way, local communities will feel proud and with more hope and they will defend parks. That's, that was kind of the logic. And it worked very well. I mean, this area, we started talking about uh, gateways, entrances. We were providing access to the, to the inner wetland. These reintroductions were not only seen as an ecological move, but also as a productive move, because they were, we were bringing attractions to the area and economic assets. So all this was, that was already planned, it was communicated in another way, it was received much better. The people then understood why we were doing that and they were interested. So all these species that we were introducing, the taper, and also it allowed us to start talking about reintroducing jaguars in a cattle ranching society. I mean, the, the, the basic uh, sim symbology of the area is about cattle ranching, it's, it's grasslands. Very, very traditional. And then I will kind of explain you why it works so well. So the people were very interested in the idea of being in the Jaguars because we were putting corrientes in the map. This is a marginal province in Argentina, lots of enthusiasm. Then the new species were seen as production. They were seen as something uh, useful for the economy. And we were also able to connect that with, with local culture. And, and the Correntinos are very proud about their gaucho culture. It's very distinctive. They, they've been able to, to maintain their, the way they dress, the way they, they, they manage the livestock, the way they, they move through the wetlands. And they speak an Amerindian language. They speak Guarani. And in Guarani, the Guarani language is the origin of the word Jaguar. Jaguar that we speak in English or Hawaii in Spanish. It comes from Guarani. So for them, talking about bringing back the Jaguar was connecting them with their roots and with their traditions. Their folklore, they have lots of songs about Jaguars. They, they are always about lament and the loss of the Jaguar, but not about dominion. So connecting culture with economy and with restoration, it allowed to poof, get huge support for, the, for a park that nobody wanted and for a ecological restoration that the people didn't understand. So we could create a campaign connecting wildlife with culture. The gauchos would be proudly showing the jaguars. The world started listening to this, uh, National Geographic, New York Times, um, and it became something global. Artists and local people were, were able to find clients and a public for skills that were getting lost, traditional skills. We were able to talk to a president of the nation in a way that would receive us, uh, because if we talk about ecological restoration, we will never be able to talk to a president, but we were talking about innovation and Argentina becoming a leader in South America about this. Then the president was interested. The president created the national park that again, nobody wanted. And today there are eight jaguars living free uh, with no supplementation and what is most important, the local society and the national society are very, very supportive of the idea of the Jaguar coming back. So the way we frame, the, reframe the conversation allowed us to become effective. 
And this is the first part of the book. Uh, this is how our organization, the Wild in Argentina, uh, communicates themselves today. But if I look at other organizations, and, and this is this term is just an adaptation of other terms that other organizations that are effective on the ground they use. This is African Parks, one of the uh, most effective organizations in the world right now. And if you look at the, the way they present their vision, it's very similar. They connect ecotourism, biodiversity conservation, community development. Uh, Rewilding Europe is doing something similar, connecting again uh, rural development, ecotourism, and rewilding. Uh, even in North America, I found out that Turner Endangered Species Fund is using a very equivalent term, what they call wild working landscapes. Again, combining economic use with actually what is restoration. I mean, they are restoring the bison landscape, and they say that bison can live with wolves and they are very proud about it. Or even the American Prairie Reserve are doing something similar. And if you look at the way they communicate their project, it's very similar to what they do in Southern Africa. So this is kind of the concept, the initial part of the book, and this is the concept of yeah, full nature or producción de naturaleza. It's a way to communicate and to envision conservation so that society supports you. Yeah. How would you say this is different from other ecotourism uh, structures for conservation? Well, I think it goes beyond ecotourism. I mean, ecotourism mm -hmm. becomes uh, kind of the main economic engine, but the, I think something important in Argentina is connecting it with local culture and also with artisans and other and other economic activities. There are some ecotourism companies that are profit companies in Africa that are doing exactly the same from, from the profit side. So you don't even have to be an NGO. I mean, as long as you connect what you will call the core ecotourism, which is the, the interface between these, these two parts with actual conservation through parks, we are doing that. The problem with some ecotourism uh, companies is that they only do this, but they don't work on this. They, they, mm -hmm. they use that as an externality that someone else is working on restoration or is working creating the parks. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the method you proposed in the book, what you call the wheel and the boat? Um, okay. What does it mean? Why is it relevant? Okay, yeah. thank you, Juan Carlos. Uh, so the, the rest of the book, it comes from my obsession in thinking, in, in that trip that I told you at the beginning, one of my big questions, I mean, I moved from being very interested in species and ecosystems to become very interested in organizations and processes and in conservation itself, in what you would call institutional ecology. So I started thinking what was, which method is the best to become effective in conservation. And I started seeing that the typical, most of the conservation manuals, they work with linear methods that they follow a very technical view because they are written by scientists and, and technical people. It, this is kind of the typical model that you will see in, in many of the books about planning uh, projects. But uh, the more I started getting involved in, in actual processes, I started seeing that the, the, those processes are much, much messier. You can't wait to all those phases. And it, actually I studied reading about the policy process. I mean, Susan Clark from the US is the first person I, I wrote, wrote about it in the, in the 90s. And the, the policy sciences, they, promote, they, they explain an approach to manage what you call public processes or political processes that is much more complete and integrative than the, what you see from the, nat the natural sciences. It includes things like conflict management that typically the, the other methods don't include because conflict tends to be an, an anomaly for scientists. The conflict happens when people act wrong or crazy, but actually conflict, anybody who works in, in, in this kind of processes, conflict is inevitable. It's not a mistake, it's part of the system. They need to promote your ideas because it's not about writing a paper and being right is much more complex than that. 
Uh, so what I started creating is, is this kind of metaphor that to manage a conservation process, a program, you need to manage a whole wheel of, the, of decisions or, or phases. I mean, it's more like they are not things that you do one after the other at the same time. So in every conservation action, even when you're in a workshop or a planning meeting or when you are building a park or when you are releasing a giant anteater, you are doing information gathering, you are promoting your project, you are managing conflict, you are creating norms, you are actually managing something like releasing two anteaters or doing a prescribed fire. And you need to plan that and you do that all at the same time. And this is kind of, it was very hard for me to see this wheel. It took me years because we've been trained to see lineal processes step by step. And that training is good for certain tasks that are technical and simple, but because conservation itself is not technical and simple and it's complex, you need to have a broader view in which once in a while or as part of that, you will include linear tasks. So this is the, what I, what I propose is that you need to manage the whole wheel at the, in, in, a, in a complete way. You cannot manage, put your focus only in one part. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so most of the book, as you see there, most of, is about the different parts of the wheel. I haven't seen any conservation manual that include, includes information about all these parts of the wheel. Typically, there are many good, many good books about planning, some of it, of course, about management of areas or ecosystems or species, good books about uh, education or communication, but including that in a whole method that is, that is cohesive and integrates everything, I haven't seen it before. So I think that's kind of the new part. And then to connect the wheel that it needs to be balanced and to move forward with an organization. And since you're talking about organizations, why do you think um, it, it merits uh, focusing so much of our efforts and of your book into how an organization operates and, and how, how are its inner workings? I mean, even, even if, let's say, myself or you, Juan Carlos, or anybody in the audience understands the wheel, they, they say, yeah, great, now I understand everything, and I know how, how to see how to do conflict management and to promote and to do management of species. And even if you see the wheel, you, the wheel cannot go by itself. It needs the boat, it needs an organization. Nobody can do conservation alone. It's, it's too complex. And actually no organization can do co uh, conservation by itself. It, even the most powerful government, even the National Park Service or the US Fish and Wildlife Service can do conservation alone. So once you see this logic and you understand that the public process is very important to create and to uh, promote organizations that are effective to manage that, that kind of thing. And in, in this regard, leadership, I mean, the captain of the boat or the captains of the boat are absolutely uh, decisive. Uh, in my experience, Behind uh, every successful conservation project that I know, there are people that have, have been leaders. They, 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 they've gone beyond what was expected of them uh, to create that, 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 to manage that, that process. The general, they had, to commit, they had to commit for 10 years at least, uh, big family decisions. So, yeah, it's tough. So yeah, the last part of the book, it kind of explains the different characteristics of, a, of, a, of what I see as an, an effective organization. These are people that, I, people that I've met that are good conservation leaders in many, many countries. And this is kind of, a, this is another of the, of the graphs of the models inside the book that describes a, a model for effective organizations, which starts with, senior leadership that creates a very clear vision that is also inspiring, but that, that are on the ground, that they see what's happening on the ground. They are, they are not far away in a, in a central office 
in a big city where the money is, they are actually in contact with biodiversity is, which usually biodiversity and money are not in the same place. They tend to be apart. Uh, so, and that this kind of starts this kind of, and again, we see another virtuous cycle uh, because that allows for contextuality, that kind of leadership adapts to the context instead of just applying the same formula over and over again from a, some kind of bureaucratic apparatus in some central office, uh, allows for the, and promotes the appearance of several levels of leadership at the local level, local people, people connected to the national level with the national offices, uh, people who can take decisions, who see the vision and they can adapt the vision to their tasks, a very important, all these organizations that, that I've been seeing that are quite particularly outstanding, they are very focused on, they are outcome, outcome oriented. Uh, you need results that are finally expressed either in populations or in habitats. We are talking about hectares, or we are talking about numbers of individuals. And at the end, you need to focus on those results. I mean, plans, laws, education talks those are means to an end those are not the final outcomes the final outcomes are about biodiversity and in general many of these organizations are very good in communicating that which allow them to get resources at multiple scales uh, and when i say resources it's not only money it's also political support and, and the empathy of local people uh, and also in general they they get a long-term financial autonomy, they get enough funding to work for many years, and they don't respond to some kind of faraway central office that, in, that it kind of imposes a vision that is not uh, good for the, for, the, for the area where you're working, that is not contextual. So that, that's, that's kind of the, that kind of organizational model, yeah. Thank you, Ignacio. This has all been very informative. I really appreciate it, as I think um, our audience appreciates it. And now we're going to open up the floor for any questions. I see that some have actually been coming in through the chat. Um, um, I'll help you, Ignacio, field those. So uh, we have a question from Joaquin Murrieta. What made you think about the importance of connecting uh, environmental restoration to cultural restoration? Uh, that's a very good question. And I think it's, uh, whenever it's feasible, and in my experience, it's feasible in most of the cases, uh, it's a great strategy and it's extremely important. In, uh, just to give you an example, I mean, the way we connected a species reintroduction with the revalorization of the gaucho and the Guarani culture in Corrientes, it was absolutely critical to get uh, public support and to get uh, that kind of yeah, momentum. I can imagine the same uh, in Southern Africa with the reintroduction of cheetahs and connecting that with the Sulu culture. Even in Spain right now, I guess where I'm working in the mountain areas of Spain, People are very proud, but at the same time, they feel abandoned by the government. So if you can connect uh, the reintroduction of the black vulture that we're doing with their pride for their mountain villages and their fiestas, which come from the Middle Ages, it's great if you can do that. And, and it's not, and if you see, the people take it as something very natural. It, it's, we're talking about heritage. And the moment you connect cultural and natural heritage, the people take it as something very natural and they don't resist it. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, we've got some more questions. Uh, how can we contact Ignacio? Our, our, um, our staff at Wildlands Network can help you connect with, with him, as well as get you information on the you know, obtaining copies of the book and the presentation. Um, a question from Ignacio. If the, of the species you've worked with, which one fascinates you the most and why? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think I'm the worst person to answer that question. I, I don't have a favorite species. I, I get 
bored very easily and I get in love with the new one. <laughs> so yeah, maybe if I had to say someone, I would go for the Sifaka in, 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 in Madagascar, but I'm not a species freak too much. Yeah. No. You I'm love the system. I, I, I am an organization <laughs> freak, which is, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite organization then? <laughs> Do you want to hear it? <laughs> no, I, um, we'll <laughs> we'll let you decide if you want to answer that or not. <laughs> we don't want anybody. I, I we published this year a, a paper about four where I, where I see as four very effective organizations. So that, that's very interesting. So yeah, one is rewild in Argentina that I think is growing very well in Argentina. The other is African Parks, the other is Australian Wildlife Conservancy, and the other one is Mauritius Wildlife Foundation. Three very big and another quite small. So th those are kind of personal favorites. And the paper explains uh, the re there are really outstanding results. Yeah. Yes, well, um, our attendees will have to read the book and learn more about all of those great organizations. <laughs> I think they're very good examples. Um, we have a question in the q and I'll remember our audience that you can also use the Q&A to send uh, your question. This one is both for me and you. Recently learned that jaguars used to inhabit the southwestern United States. What's being done to bring jaguars back to their historic range? And what could this efforts incorporate from Ignacio's rewilding work in Argentina? I can answer the first part of the question, and then you'll tell us uh, what we can learn from, from your experience. So yes, there, there is uh, a number of jaguars that have been sighted in, in Arizona particularly, and a few of them in New Mexico over the last 20 years and um, and uh, they're coming from a population in northwest Mexico in the state of Sonora. Um, just today, the Washington Post published uh, an article on one of uh, the uh, celebrity individuals that uh, was roaming in the towns and the mountains near Tucson, um, was uh, missing in action for about um, seven years and was recently recited in central Sonora. So there's there's a binational interest in, in reintroducing them somehow in the United States. There are concerns that the population in Sonora might not take the, um, might not support animals being captured there. So what would you recommend in a situation where the closest population is probably not a good source of, of jaguars since they're, they're already scarce there? Ignacio. Are you asking me, Juan Carlos? Yes, if uh, we've got a situation where, <laughs> yes, the the near the closest jaguars to the United States live in a population that is not very, not very big. So, uh, how would you go about reintroducing jaguars into the Southwest? What what recommendations would you have? Okay, okay, this is my opinion. I may be totally wrong. I. I mean, after, after talking to you these days, I, I, I was actually thinking what has happened in, I mean, and I may be wrong. I have a feeling that the US is losing a kind of tract and, and, and its leadership role in conservation in the world. I mean, it's kind of getting outdated in many things. I have that feeling because I, I've seen how the black-footed ferret is crashing the population, even though there's techniques and vaccine, but they just need money and the money is not coming. You have the largest, I mean, by far, conservation philanthropies in the world, and they're investing away of the United States. So I think I wouldn't focus on the jaguars. I wouldn't focus on where to get jaguars. I mean, that's kind of the typical biological answer. My, my question would be, you need to create a narrative that uh, creates enthusiasm towards the idea of restoring jaguars in southern United States, in, in that area, mm -hmm. because there's huge money in your country, there's expertise, there's, there's know-how, but for some reason, your, your biggest investor, investors in conservation are going away from the United States and they're investing in Africa. So I don't understand why you, those guys are not buying land in, 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 in Texas or wherever mm -hmm. it is. And, then getting the animals, I mean, they don't have to be the same subspecies and all that kind of obsession. I mean, you can get the hour. I mean, it's, it's, everything is the same subspecies. So 
It's about, it's about mm -hmm. getting land. And once you have 50,000 hectares or a little more that are private and you manage for that and you control threats there, you can start a population. And that's about money at the end. But I think the, I think the main problem is there's something going on in the United States that the, the conservationists are not really creating enthusiasm to the huge rich guys that you have there that they're spending money either on less useful things or they are spending money in other countries. Yeah, that's that's but, an interesting take. And, and I think yeah, you're right on <laughs> in many regards. And so I can imagine. Well, I think you and I and others in this call have the benefit of, of uh, looking at the United States from outside and, and and being able to see some of these patterns, you know, of uh, how how there was this much energy throughout the 20th century and how it seems to be, you know, what what I would describe a lack of imagination recently in, in coming up with new ways of, of conserving. And there's a lot to learn, like you brought up in your book from, from places in Africa and Latin America that have no lack of imagination, even if they don't have as many resources. <laughs> um, and moving on with the questions from our audience, what is the biggest conservation concern right now that you have um, that might be related to our conversation just now? It's climate change. I mean, climate change climate is changing, change. Every, it's changing everything. I mean, it is, and, and again, it, I think it's very related to what you just said, that we have to be very imaginative and very flexible and very innovative because the typical approach of creating parks and then conserving things inside parks is just outdated. I mean, the, 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 the flora and the fauna is going to move away from the parks because everything is changing. So uh, at the same time, is pulling away lots of money from, from taking away money from biodiversity conservation because it's, it's, it's the main concern now. So I think to reconnect the conservation movement of the 90s with the threats and opportunities of conservation in 2022, I think that's a big challenge. And again, like every challenge is an opportunity, but as you, you, you were just saying, we need to think in a different way. This is not gonna, this is not gonna be solved by lawsuits like it has been done in the United States for many years or, mm -hmm. or, or the typical environmental education going to schools. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, Another question from uh, our audience, how can we effectively involve the private sector, mainly tourism in these conservation efforts? And in Mexico, we have significant challenges and the private sector is not committed to conservation. The, I mean, the private sector in Latin America and even in Spain is not really committed in, in philanthropy very much. Actually, I've seen more philan conservation philanthropists in Mexico than in Argentina. So at least you have a few of them. Uh, I think again, it's, it's related to the other question. It's, it's about the way we communicate. I mean, when we talk to the private sector, we need to talk in a way in which they feel excited and they feel that, that they, you are speaking their language. And if we use terms that are too scientific and we don't use images in the right way, today we need to use videos are a very, very powerful uh, tool uh, scientific papers are a disastrous tool to talk to the private sector, of course, or giving a PowerPoint presentation with lots of graphs. Uh, so it's about the storytelling at the end. Yeah, I, I think everyone, everybody wants, everybody likes nature in general, and every, everybody wants to do good in general. You have to present it in a way in which it's a win-win. And within the private sector, ecotourism is the best potential ally for conservation. Of course, you have to regulate and you have to manage uh, potential conflicts of interest, but at the beginning, it's about creating opportunities for, for partnerships. Before starting worrying about <laughs> what could happen, get partners and then you will, you will work with them. Yeah. Yeah, um, definitely. Mm, another question from our from our audience. What makes the four organizations you mentioned so effective over others? Uh, is I mean, what, what, what the results are absolutely outstanding, and what makes them effective, especially effective, is that graph that I showed you. I mean, 
very strong leadership with 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 an in, with a very inspirational vision, uh, boots on the ground, connecting uh, the restoration agenda with local development, all these all these things that we talk about. So that that's that graph that I, that I showed at, at the end is what makes them, or I see that make, that they all have in common, good communications, mm -hmm. uh, uh, leadership at different levels, uh, working at many scales, local, provincial, state, national, international, all those things. And of course, not just thinking as biologists, but thinking about as politicians, communicators, and many other approaches. Excellent, thank you. We've got a couple more questions from the Q and A. Um, do you have any recommendations for how to apply the economic and cultural approach of frame cons or, or frame conservation in a more urban setting? How would you apply this to a more urban setting? I think at the, at the end, of the basic concept is is the is the same. I mean, if you let's say that you want to build larger parks inside a city, you want to reintroduce a species that, I don't know, the peregrine falcon or whatever, or you want to conserve the macos that are in Caracas. Uh, at the end, it's about connecting your agenda, your conservation agenda with the material and less tangible needs of the local people. So you're gonna be talking about jobs, you're gonna be talking about identity, uh, brand building is extremely important. So I could imagine, I don't know, a city like Bogota or Austin in Texas that they have, they are proud about their javelinas or whatever, or about a uh, species that they're bringing back. So it's very similar. I mean, at the end, people are people. It's about pride, jobs, uh, identity, and hope for the, for the future. Uh, the rest is, is just contextual approaches and techniques that you will use depending on the size of the city or whatever species you want to work with. I mean, rural people and urban people are not so different at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there is a complex question in Spanish in our Q and A, which I will try to um, translate. Um, mm, what can we do to wake up the interest of um, the general population on conservation when the political culture is sort of op opposed to it and has even repressed violently uh, environmental activism? I mean, what, one thing is environmental activism, which is about denouncing things, okay? It's, it's, it's kind mm -hmm. of, you can, you can call it as negative promotion. Would you attack someone and you denounce things? And, and that's extremely important in, in some situations. Activism doesn't promote conservation agenda. What it, what it does is stop a direct threat. And it's very important mm -hmm. for that. If you want to create a culture of conservation in any country, and I think Argentina is a very good example because it didn't have a culture of parks or, or restoration 15 years ago, and, and now it's doing that. And the, and the example of Costa Rica for the last 30 years is one of the best examples. At the end, you want to connect uh, the national identity and what defines a nation with nature. Uh, the United States is an excellent example in how you connected national parks with, with patriotism. Uh, you have this PBS series of national parks, uh, America's best idea, an excellent example of how to connect something very specific as national parks with myths and uh, interests and narratives of both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, the way Rwanda is now connecting uh, parks and rewilding with ecotourism with the rebirth of a country that, that, that went through one of the worst genocides of the 20th century. So at the end, you have to connect uh, the wildlife or the biodiversity on the ecosystems you want to restore or protect with what people really care about, which is gonna be history, culture, jobs, economy. Uh, it's about hearing what the people talk about and they care about and speaking in their language without losing your values and, and your interests. 
Thank you, Ignacio. Mm -hmm. We're going to um, include two more questions from the audience before we wrap it up. And, and thank you for being with us. Um, the first one is, how do you convince producers of the concept of having keystone wildlife species on the landscape that could cause property damage or livestock damage, for instance, grizzly bears? And I guess this is related to your experience with jaguars in ranching communities of Argentina. Okay, wow. Uh, you have to work at, I mean, this is very fast, of course, and it will take 20 minutes to explain it, but I think <laughs> a quick way to answer it is, I think you have to work at two levels. One is, please don't offend them. And I think one of the worst problems, many of the problems in conservation is about people getting offended. I mean, much of the conflict with the grizzlies and the wolves in the American West is not about the wolves or, or it's about foreigners telling them what to do or whatever, or the federal government with power. So the first thing that we had to do in Iberá was to live there, work with uh, higher local people, uh, create local jobs and speak their language in, and, and just work with them when there was a fire and to control the fire or to help the neighbors when they had to move livestock through our properties that they had no livestock. So one thing is please don't offend the people even if you don't think the same as them and, and you don't share many values, there are always common values that you can work with them. Just being a good neighbor or being a decent people or being honest and straightforward. The other one is try to avoid damage. Uh, in, in, in Southern Africa, what they do is defend the areas because they have elephants and lions and and species like that. Uh, in other places, what you do is you you pay compensation. So you you try to, to yeah, I mean to compensate that economic damage. But many of the conflicts are not about money; are about a lot, lack of respect. So if you work there, you're a good neighbor. You respect them. You talk to them. You try to find solutions together. And and at the same time, beyond that kind of intangible. Uh, behavior, you do something very, very tangible, like you pay compensation, you pay quick, uh, you try to, of course, buy as much land as possible to create a buffer. Uh, so you have to do both things at the same time. The practical solutions and the more psychological uh, yeah, human solutions. And the other question sort of expands on the on the theme of of uh, collaborating between diverse stakeholders, which is um, how can countries start working closer with each other and start being examples on how proper conservation should be done? Okay, the, uh, I think the best way to promote uh, that kind of collaboration is through through this kind of engagement that we're doing right now. I mean, just uh, sharing is. Uh, examples of successful projects, uh, hearing what is going on in other countries, learning from other countries, because there's always something different that you can learn. So instead of creating some kind of international agreement or alliance between countries that there are enough of them, there's, there's a biodiversity convention that has been signed and it doesn't seem to be working very well. I think it's very important that as as conservationists, if we have a good project and a good story to tell, we analyze it because many people do amazing projects, but they don't think about it. So we analyze uh, why when, why when, why it was successful, which were our mistakes, and we share those experiences with other groups. And that's exactly what happened in Southern Africa. And that's kind of the reasons behind whew, a huge increase of innovation and doing things that were totally unheard. And it's because the practitioners there are exchanging information all the time. And in general, other conservationists that are kind of more academic, we tend to be jealous and some NGOs don't share information with the others. So it's about sharing information and, and creating a big community of knowledge, of practical knowledge that will improve the standards uh, globally. I just invented this, but I hope it makes sense. It, it does make sense, Ignacio. And with this, I, I think it is, is a perfect way to, to close our conversation today. 
uh, for those of you who, who join us from different channels and are not uh, necessarily aware of Wildlands Network, uh, we are an international conservation group that's um, devoted to conser connectivity conservation through science-based research and innovative policy. We work to prevent biodiversity loss and promote climate change resilience. By collaborating with local partners and people, we empower communities across North America to safeguard their wild places. This is a short announcement of who we are. I think it is very much aligned with what Ignacio has been uh, sharing with us. And we hope to have more of these um, international experiences where we can share uh, what people are learning throughout the world in, in advancing conservation in our continent. Uh, so I want to say thank you again to everyone who attended. Uh, gracias, Ignacio. Thank you for your time here. I hope a lot of you uh, go in and read Ignacio's book. It's uh, it's very interesting. It's a good read. It's very provocative. It's got great illustrations, by the way. And um, um, I don't know if you want to say anything else as we close this conversation, Ignacio. The, the illustrations were done by one of my brothers. Uh, five brothers uh, collaborated in that book. That's probably the only conservation book in which five siblings worked <laughs> together there. So thanks a lot, guys. It was a pleasure talking to you. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Ignacio. Buen día. Thank you, everyone. Daniel, do you have any closing comments uh, with information for our audience? Or will that be it? Um, You're muted. Just that we'll have links to the recording on our website later today, um, and we'll follow up on any specific questions that are outstanding. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Again, gracias. Everyone. Have a good day. Bye.